And joining us now on the debate for the full hour tonight, in Atlanta, Georgia, Judy Curry, Chair at the School of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences at the Georgia Institute of Technology. In the nation's capital, Jim Bruce, former Assistant Deputy Minister of Environment Canada. In Sudbury, Ontario, David Pearson, Professor in the Department of Earth Sciences at Laurentian University. And here in studio, Gord Miller, Environmental Commissioner of Ontario, and Doug McDonald, Professor at the Centre for the Environment at the University of Toronto. And this being a Your Agenda Thursday broadcast, you are part of the discussion, so come on in. You can reach us via Twitter at twitter.com slash the agenda or by email at the agenda at tvo.org. Jump in, join the debate. We'll put some of your comments on the screen throughout the course of tonight's broadcast. Also, as always, we're hosting a live chat on our Inside Agenda blog. That's on our homepage, so dial us up at tvo.org slash the agenda and join your fellow viewers that way, too. A welcome to everybody, uh, both here in the studio and in Points Beyond tonight for our discussion. These Thursday broadcasts are very often... Uh, informed by the emails that we get or the posts that we get on our website. I want to read just a couple of them uh, that we got, uh, which um, I guess were instructive in helping us figure out what tonight's program would be about. Here we go. First one, do you think scientists were properly trained to enter the policy world, or are politicians trained and competent to understand scientific issues, which are determined by data and not vote counts? That question out there. Here's a follow-up. If politics is not science, why is environmentalism's leader... Al Gore. You should see his house. Compared to Bush the Seconds, he's got a big mansion. Okay, we got a bunch of those kinds of emails, and I want to start by just sort of letting everybody set the lay of the land tonight. And um, let's, let's go to Sudbury first. You're at a dinner party. Everybody, consider this scenario. You're at a dinner party, and pretty soon it becomes apparent that you've got a passion for this climate change issue. How do you explain to people what your role in this whole debate, in this whole issue, is all about. Go ahead, start us off, Sudbury. Well, I tell them that I deal with the second side of the, uh, the climate change sandwich, that the top side is reducing greenhouse gases, and I'm a firm believer that greenhouse gases are part of uh, what's responsible for climate change. But I deal with the adaptation side. In other words, what do we do about the climate change that's already occurring and about the climate change that, um, uh, that is bound to happen because we can't change our, uh, our industrial system fast enough. So how do we put bigger pipes in the ground? How do we get water away from uh, from culverts that are going to wash out, and and how do we how do we make the best of uh, of the climate, the new climate that we've created? That's what I tell people is is my part of climate change. Gotcha. Thanks, David. Judy, what do you say? Well, I'm a scientist that studies the physical basis of climate change, that the processes that contribute to climate <coughs> change, and what I tell people, you know people will ask me, well, what should we be doing about climate change? And this is where I have to tell them that I don't have any particularly good ideas or any special knowledge about what we should do about climate change. What I can help people understand is the risk that we're facing from climate change. And you can think of risk as a combination of what can happen times the probability that it might actually happen. So that's my role in this. Jim Bruce, how about you? Well, in uh, the 80s, I was involved in establishing the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and I've been associated with it uh, up until its uh, 2007 report. So I am uh, very interested in how that uh, process ha interacts with the governments and the politicians and uh, how that might be advanced in the future. Uh, also, I've, as an Assistant Deputy Minister in Environment Canada, I had a lot of interaction with ministers, uh, and I must say my impression is uh, that it was much easier to work with ministers uh, in the 70s and 80s than it is now. Did you ever run for office? No. So you don't know politics from that side of the street, but you do certainly from having worked in the civil service with them. Yes. Gotcha. Okay. And just to take 20 seconds here and remind everybody, because we referred to it numerous times this week during our special series here, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, reminds what, about 190 some odd countries that have come together with a plan for attacking this thing? Help me out here. No, they, they haven't come together with a plan to attack it. They've come together with a, uh, a program to assess 
the scientific evidence that's out there in published papers and some of them in gray, gray literature, as you call it, uh, but in the scientific knowledge that's available from all the countries in the world and trying to put that together into a coherent picture so that uh, uh, people understand what's happening to the world's climate. Gotcha. Gordon Miller, how about you? Well, I'm the Environmental Commissioner of Ontario, and in that role, I oversee government decision-making of 14 government ministries as it respects, with respect to the environment, and certainly climate change is a very, very important climate, uh, environmental issue these days. So my role is to oversee government decision-making to, to speak, if you like, for the environment, a voice. I often say I speak for the trees at Queen Park, Queen's Park, because <laughs> no one else does. So, um, and I do get involved you know, with the science and the policy because I do assess government policy and make recommendations relating to government policy with respect to climate change. I also have a special duty to oversee the government success at reducing greenhouse gases and I have to give a special report to the Legislature of Ontario each year uh, independently evaluating how well they're doing. And just so people understand your role down there, you actually don't report to the Premier. No, you report I've to all 107 MPPs. That's correct. And you do have, you have a scientific background. Started in science. But you, done the politics. I was going to say, you've also run for office a couple of times, too. Yes. So you ran once provincially, once federally. Yes. Okay, so you, you have seen uh, political science, if I can put it that way, from both sides of the street. Doug McDonald, your turn. Uh, like some of your other guests, I'm uh, uh, an academic, but I'm not a scientist. I'm a social scientist. So my subject matter is environmental politics, and in terms of climate change, what I spend my time trying to do is to understand the politics of the issue, why the issue is unfolding the way it is in Canada and globally. The areas of research that I'm doing at the moment, uh, there are two major ones in terms of climate change. First is the Canadian federal provincial process, and we're examining the question of why the provinces have been unable to agree on how to divide up the total Canadian reduction effort that is required, why we have no coherence in the present Canadian uh, policy. And the second thing that I look at is the role of the industry sectors like electricity or oil and gas who are being asked to reduce their emissions. And I'm not looking at it from a technical viewpoint so much as trying to understand the sources of the political power of those sectors. Okay. We, I mean, we, I think people may have to humor us a little bit on the premise of this program, the premise being that there are kind of two solitudes that are out there in trying to deal with this issue. There are those in politics, there are those in science. Of course there are people who have a scientific background who are in public life, but there's a lot more lawyers and teachers down there at Queen's Park, for example, than there are scientists, although there are some. So Judy, let me start with you on this one. Do scientists agree amongst themselves, generally speaking, on whether or not political action is appropriate for people who go into that profession? Um, th there's a lot of, most scientists ignore politics and policy. And, and in the climate field, I would say that's true, um, especially people studying the physical aspects of the climate change problem. The people studying the impacts, the biologists, the public health people, they tend to be a little bit more associated with the environmental movement and a little bit more activists. But I would say that the large majority of the scientists ignore the politics and the policy and just get on with their work. Um, there are some scientists who choose to be very vocal advocates for certain policies. And those scientists, again, people question their motives and they look extra carefully at their science because they wonder if their, you know, their, their personal bias is you know, showing up in their science. So there's no hard and fast rules or guidelines for scientists. And for scientists that have, do engage in the policy process and get mixed up in politics. There's all sorts of pitfalls that um, many of us have fallen into. And um, some of us land in that kind of a position inadvertently and some people seek out you know, that kind of confrontation and engagement. Gotcha. So there's a whole range of, uh, of involvements and there's no simple recipe for how to do it effectively. Gordon Miller. Well, one of the big problems is that scientists deal in uncertainty. And that is their whole field. They're always trying to reduce the uncertainty. They make their conclusions usually on, we have you know, a one chance in 20, a 95% confidence interval in our, our conclusions. And if you take that kind of, it's very, scientists are very comfortable with that because they know how much 
how much we don't know out there. And, and advancing something with 95% confidence is, is very comfortable to a scientist. Yeah. But you take that into the greater world, in a world full of, uh, of lawyers uh, who you know, argue facts and case, and economists, of course, who never put confidence intervals around their estimates. They just confidently say, with, with total certainty, it's going to be 3% next year. And in that world, when we, you know, as scientists, speaking as a scientist, former scientist, um, express uncertainty, people see it as, oh my gosh, you don't know. And, and, I, and it's so that we're, we're ill-equipped to deal, many of us, in that field. David Pearson, what's your view on that? Well, I, you know, I, I want to say first that there are exceptions to the, to the rule you just pointed out there, uh, Steve, and, and, and one of them is, is right there in Queen's Park. You know, we have a premier who's, uh, whose first degree is, uh, is in biology, and, and sometimes we, we forget that, and, but I, I do admit that he's one of, uh, one of very few. But I do think that there's, a, there's, a, there's some common ground here that, uh, that Judy mentioned when she, she brought up the word risk. Uh, I think that gov one of the main roles of government is to, in fact, reduce the risks, to, to minimize the risks that, uh, that citizens face, whether it's H1N1 or it's Ponzi schemes or, or whatever it might be. Certainly a major part of what government does is to reduce risk. And I think that part of what scientists are looking for is not just a physical explanation for, um, uh, for climate change, but the risks that that involves for ecosystems, for communities, for, uh, for farmers, for individuals, for parts of uh, parts of the the, the eco zones of the planet and so forth so there is a common ground and that's that's risk uh, and I think that uh, when scientists and politicians get together they can talk in fact about risk and and that involves consideration of, uh, of uncertainty as, as, as Gord said so there is some there is some common ground one can look for the for the half full glass rather than the, the half empty glass when one looks from science to politics or from politics to science I want to follow up on the example that Judy Curry gave and do it with Jim Bruce because I wonder when you were working in Environment Canada and you may have run into a scientist who was, let's say, particularly passionate about a particular issue or who was uh, unusually political, let's put it that way, in their enthusiasm for dealing with politicians. Did you find that helpful because they were prepared to play ball in the political arena or did you regard that with suspicion? Uh, well, often they didn't play ball in the political arena. They just expressed their... Uh, scientific findings with the little band of uncertainty very forcefully in an effort to get uh, uh, people to take appropriate action or the politicians to take appropriate action on that issue. I remember very well a scientist in, uh, in, at the Canada Centre for Inland Waters in Burlington where I was in the 60s uh, who was a very strong proponent of action to reduce uh, toxic chemicals going into the Great Lakes. And uh, he, he didn't exaggerate, but he put his case extremely forcefully and was able to get some real measures put in place. Okay, let me follow up with Doug McDonald then. The interplay between the work of scientists and environmental activists, what's it like? Uh, the, they play two different roles. Um, as Judy was saying, scientists have to be fairly careful about stepping into the political arena. And environmentalists are in the political arena to start with. So scientists do the work which is put out in the scientific arena and which gives legitimacy then to the claims that are made by environmentalists who are functioning in the political arena. So environmentalists basically function to broadcast the claims of science and to put them onto the, uh, the policy agenda. Do scientists regard that exercise with a certain amount of, uh, I'm not sure what the right word I'm looking for here is, but you know, we're doing the pure good stuff, you know, that comes down from Mount Sinai and these people are getting their hands dirty in that world over there. Is there some of that attitude involved? Perhaps, but the scientists that I, the, the physical natural scientists that I know, tend to have considerable sympathy for the cause of environmental protection, but they have the kind of constraints that, that Judy was, was talking about. I guess the, the, the point I'd like to make, if I could just continue for a minute, I'd, I'd just like to make a couple of points. The first, it seems to me generally with environmental policy issues that the role of science and scientists is greatest at the beginning when the, the issue is emerging for these reasons I've been talking about of, uh, as a source of legitimacy for putting the issue onto the policy agenda. Once the issue's there and governments have said, yes, we're going to have to do something about this because of public demand, which has been mobilized by the environmental movement, 
then the science becomes less important than it was at the, at the original stages. Mm -hmm. Because then basically what governments have to do is to negotiate with the economic actors, the business actors, who are going to have to bear the cost of action. Mm. And that becomes a large part of what influences policy, as I think everybody on this, this panel, and I think you yourself would, would agree. And so when, when we're talking about the connection between science and policy, we need to remember that's only part of the picture. There's this other very large part of the picture which simply has to do with political power. But, but you know, but, but Doug, in, in this particular case of climate change, haven't we, you know, isn't it a retrograde situation? I mean, the science was put on the agenda back in the 80s, and uh, people like Jim Bruce and, and people um, like James Hansen in the United States, who, you know, testified before congressional com or Senate committees back in 88, I think it was. And, and clearly, we had presidential speech, speeches referring to climate change, and, and it was, we, the scientists did their job, and they put it on the agenda, and we put it forward, and the IPCC was charged up and, and went forward. Uh, but then, once it became, you know, looked like that this is a real action would have to come out of it, then we see this counterattack from these economic forces against the science, to undermine the science. And so, you know, the scientists did their job. They got the president of the United States and leaders of states all around mm -hmm. the world to agree to do something, and then they found themselves under attack. That makes us unique. Doug, quick comeback? No, uh, no, yes, it's not. Yeah. I'll Hang on, Jim, stand by one. Quick I'll, to Doug I'll and then to be, Jim. just be very, very quick. I agree completely that the science did do the job. It is on the policy agenda. And that's why I would argue what's going on now is largely irrelevant. That the debate now, the political debate now, isn't about the science. It's about the cost and who's going to bear mm -hmm. the cost. Back in the, I agree completely with what you're saying. Back in the 1990s, this kind of the climate gate thing, the East Anglia, would have had an effect on policy. My argument is that it's not going to have an effect on policy now, exactly for the reasons you say, because it is on the agenda. Okay, Jim Bruce? Well, I, I think two things. One, uh, we may be stereotyping scientists here. I think that there's scientists are, are like other folks. Uh, there's some of them are very active in trying to promote their findings and their ideas, and some of them are very reticent to do so, and will hand it over to an environmental group. Uh, on the question of uh, the uh, way in which uh, the attacks on the science uh, in, of climate change have evolved, it just reminds me of uh, several earlier experience uh, when acid rain was first put, brought forward by the scientific community. There were numerous attacks uh, on, on the science of, of acid rain as soon as it became clear uh, that in order to address it, we were going to have to bear some costs. And the same thing ha happened when uh, uh, phosphate in detergents was determined to be uh, affecting the quality of water in the Great Lakes. A big uh, campaign uh, to undermine that science was brought forward before finally uh, some actions were taken. Well, let so me follow up. Let me follow it's, up it's with David. Not for a, a new thing. Okay, no, I understand. Let me follow up with David. Does the scientific community? Understand, I don't know if you can even use that expression, the scientific community, because it's so broad and, and diverse. But for argument's sake here, does it understand how some people could believe in climate change but don't want to sacrifice their current lifestyle in order to address this problem? Do they get that? Oh, I, I, I'm sure that they do. Uh, I, I, you know, <laughs> the scientists have neighbors and they have, uh, they have relatives. They go to pubs and they talk with people and, and they, uh, they pick up those signals from the public. And, and I think that it's very important that we, um, we remember the public's role in, in this. This is not just scientists and politicians as two sort of communities fighting or agreeing or talking or not talking. Uh, the public's got an important role there. One of the emails you read at the beginning that was a bit rude about Al Gore did raise his name. And, and I think that uh, Part of uh, the way that uh, the issue is, uh, came to the agenda is not just through Jim Hansen and scientists, but through people like Al Gore. If you look at uh, if you look at public opinion polls before and after, when was it? October 2006, when uh, when Al Gore's uh, inconvenient truth was uh, was issued, you do find real differences in, uh, in in public opinion, and, and not just in North America, but in Australia and and uh, in the uh, uh, around the around the world. It's very very important to. 
remember, public here. And, and part of the, the political world is, in fact, to, to, to be responsive to the public. We, we speak about politicians being leaders, and sometimes they are, and sometimes they are in some issues, but not in others. But politicians, in the end, listen very, very carefully to the public. And I think one of the ways that scientists can put climate change on the agenda is to, is to in fact, be communicating with the public. And I think that's what Al Gore did. And I think you see, you think, I, I think we saw what, uh, what a difference that made. Judy, follow up on that if you would. I wonder if, if you could give us your view on whether the scientific community understands that people may very well believe in climate change and that humans are responsible for it, that scientists, quote unquote, have done their job making that sale, but they're not sure they want to change their lifestyle in order to do something about it. Oh, that, that's definitely a factor. Um, but I think part of the problem where the reason the science still seems relevant at this late stage in the game is because of the kind of policies that are on the table, like you know cap and trade type policies where they're talking about well what is the level of you know dangerous climate change and how much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere does that correspond to and that's sort of set by you know these scientific assessments. So, so there's a sort of a scientific management component to the policies that, you know, if the science is off by 30 percent, then that level, you know, could be, you know, significantly higher than we think. And, and, and so but by trying to approach this in a, from a scientific management perspective in terms of the policies we're talking about, the, the science itself is still relevant. And, and so this is why people keep attacking the science. And you've got, you know, people who don't like the science and then you've got some people say, well, so what if it's warmer? You know, carbon dioxide is good. What's wrong with warmer temperatures? And then you've got the people who recognize the danger but say, you know, we can't afford to or don't want to do anything about it. Mm -hmm. So you've got this sort of three, you know, levels of resistance. And I, I think science could be sort of taken out of it if the policies weren't so tied to like a scientific management strategy whereby science was setting you know, the level at 450 parts per million or, or whatever. Right. Let me go to Gordon and Jim on this is. one, the, the two of you tonight who've got the most experience with politicians. Gordon, you first and then Jim after that. Do scientists get how the political process works? I think, well, generalization, of course, and yeah. I'd say no. I they mean, don't. that's very clear. I think, uh, you know, I work in that interface all the time, and I know um, sci many scientists and, and understand that political process, and certainly that is, that is a big issue. What don't they get? Well, they don't get how that there are different ways of making decisions in society and different levels of evidence and different systems of, of choosing how you're going to do something. Uh, and they, they tend to revert as because they're trained to, as scientists, to, to the data, to the facts, to what the, and it, this is what the data tells us. And this therefore, is, the, the decision should be obvious. Should be obvious, whereas mm -hmm. uh, that, as you hinted earlier, is, is it, real political decisions are chock full of all sorts of, uh, of different, uh, not just emotion, all sorts of other factors and bargaining. And, and that is a, a game that they just don't understand. So it right. makes them ill-equipped to uh, engage uh, properly. Jim, can I get you on that? Um, yeah, I, I think there are some scientists who uh, understand the processes very well um, and, uh, and, and work the process fairly well, uh, but they run into this uh, very difficult issue that when the costs, uh, either political costs or economic costs of action, uh, get to be too high, uh, then there's a big pushback uh, from the political level to do the things which uh, the science scientists science suggests should be done, uh, but I think to go back to the point about getting the public involved, I think the kind of work that David Pearson and his group are doing up at in Sudbury to look at what are the impacts of climate change uh, and what large expenses we might uh, be involved in if we try to adapt uh, that. Uh, that's going to bring the, the, the message home much more vigorously okay, don't go uh, there than yet, we've Jim. seen so far. Don't go there yet. I'm going to get to that, but I wanna, I'm, I've got one more area I want to explore here as it relates to you know, science and politics uh, coming head to head here. And now let, let's try this on emotion. Here's how uh, Bill McKibben wrote about this in The Nation magazine recently. He said, it's a mistake to concentrate solely on the science. Science may be what we know about the world, but politics is how we feel about the world, and feelings count at least as much as knowledge. 
So, uh, okay, David, why don't I go to you on this? Do you think the scientific community fully understands the role that emotion plays in politics? No, I, I, I don't think that, uh, that the scientific community does. It's not part of uh, the scientific culture for right from being a graduate student up to, to a prof uh, or a researcher or somebody involved in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, an environmental uh, consulting company. It's, it's not part of their culture to, uh, to consider emotion. Uh, emotion is regarded as, uh, as something that uh, is unfortunate, that one really ought not to have to take into account when one makes a decision. But I think that's an enormous mistake. I and mean, the fact is that we are all of us, to a greater or lesser extent, driven by emotion. Uh, we might not show our emotion in the lab, but we show our human beings when we get home and we're, we're playing with the kids. And I think it's an enormous mistake uh, for scientists not to see that and not to regard that as a perfectly legitimate component of the way that a lot of people see the world and make judgments about it and think about it and, uh, and, and engage, in fact, in, in, in debate and discussion ab about it. I think if you go to look at the, uh, the way that the, the Danish Board of Trade have always involved the public since about the early 19, uh, the 1980s in discussion of science policy issues, whether it's climate change or whether it's genetically modified organisms, what happens there is that, in fact, the public are invited to, to participate in what are called consensus conferences in which the, the issues are discussed. They're respected, and the fact that they bring emotion to the table is, uh, is respected in that process. And I, I think that the scientists who are involved come to respect that that that's what makes a person. A person is more than science, and science is only part of the way that you make decisions in a world where, where people are the, uh, are the ingredients. Sure. Doug, we just had an email come up on the screen, uh, somebody posting in this evening asking, uh, you know, at the end of the day, who are people going to blame if we don't fix this mess? Are they going to blame the politicians, the scientists, or the industrialists? Maybe there's somebody else to be considered. You got a thought on that? Well, in a democracy, the accountability rests with the politicians for starters, but then of course for each of us as individual citizens, we also have a certain degree of uh, accountability. Um, so I would put those two groups. Uh, I would tend to agree with the points Gord was making that uh, the scientists, <coughs> to my mind, have done their job. They've done their job. It's on the table. They've made the case. And now, as Jim Bruce is saying, we're up against the cost. Well, except that. that's the stumbling point. Humor me on this. The, the, it seems that if um, it's very fashionable to be a climate skeptic nowadays, a climate change skeptic, very fashionable. And in part, and uh, Michael Smith, let's cue up this video from the, uh, the White House covered in snow. Uh, this video did, I suspect, a lot of damage to those who want to argue, hang on, Gord, let me play the video oh, first, and then I'll get you to comment on it. That was the White House a few weeks ago. Uh, scientists are asking people to make real and drastic changes to their lives based on abstract concepts, which may be right, but they're still abstract. On the other hand, people looked out their windows at Washington, D.C., including the President of the United States, not too long ago, and they saw more snow falling this winter than in any other winter since 1899. And they conclude, what is all this talk about global warming? So, um, okay, Gordon, you, can, you get okay, a first chance at that, and then we'll, we'll get the others it's in. Global warming causes climate change. And what's the first thing we, we, we've been warning for years about extreme weather events? Now, any given event, sure, you can't attribute it to climate change, but certainly that's an extreme weather event. Mm -hmm. and, and that is a, the kind of thing you will see happening because the, the thing that we call the Earth is maintaining more heat from the sun and, and all that energy that sits in the, in the atmosphere and the ocean sloshes all around and changes the weather systems and the climate. That's the point. People should have looked at Washington and said, yes, that's what they've been warning us about for years <laughs> and it's happening. Okay, but David, do scientists need to get a little better at the non-rational aspects of human behavior, which you could argue we just saw ample evidence of? Yeah, not a little better, a lot better. A lot better. A, a little better won't, won't do. Uh, yeah. and, and I think that uh, the, the, the first thing that scientists should be doing when a Washington event happens like that is make sure they get on the 6 o'clock news and explain that all that snow yeah. fell because it was increased evaporation somewhere. And that increased right. evaporation took place because the, the, uh, the, 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 air was, the air was warmer and the winds were blowing a little faster. And, uh, and, and explain the science in, in terms that, uh, that the public can understand and, and relate that to uh, to the decisions that a city council has to make, to uh, a, a state government in the case of, uh, of, of, of Washington. And, and also, the people in Toronto need to be saying, 
boy, what if that had happened here? Are we ready for that? Mm. Uh, and and one can scientists can take that event, uh, just like they took the uh, oh the heat wave in uh, in France in 2003 that ended up killing what was it 15,000 people in that country alone and over 20 in the rest of Europe in two weeks, my goodness, and take mm. those cases and turn them into stories, not into to, to scary uh, news clips, but into stories about why that happened, and and that I think makes an impact, and I, that I think is is why Al Gore made an impact because he told stories and, and that's part of what scientists need to learn to do. Judy, I wonder if this was a case of just bad marketing. You shouldn't have used global warming. That, had, <laughs> that made everybody assume that the temperatures were going to rise everywhere. The global warming leading to climate change was uh, more than a mouthful. Is it, uh, scientists need a little more help well, in marketing well, ideas? Well, yes, but I think the extreme event, I mean, scientists have figured out, like Hurricane Katrina really became a focusing event for global warming in the U.S even though you can't attribute, you know, Hurricane Katrina to global warming, um, you know, any single event, but it, it coincided with two papers, you know, relating, relating increased hurricane intensity to global warming. And so those two became convoluted in people's mind and global warming could mean, you know, more intense hurricanes like we saw in Katrina. And I think there was an enormous emotional impact from Hurricane Katrina in the U.S., and it really became a focusing event for global warming in the U.S. And I think scientists got that message, and, and you, you know, began to see people trying to pitch the extremes. You, you know, the the droughts, the extreme weather, you know, the extreme sea ice conditions. So, so I think scientists did pick up on that idea: is that there was an emotional reaction to the extreme events, and. And, and it made people consider, you know, what their common, you know, common interest in local regions might be related to, you know, climate change, related to more hurricanes or more whatever. So, mm -hmm. I, I think the whole extreme event <laughs> and, and natural disaster thing is something that I, I think the climate scientists have been playing that card for the most part. But when it gets cold or the snow, that, that's a much harder case to make. You know, <laughs> exactly. Some people have, have gone on and say, of course, global warming predicts that we would be, see more snowfall, and then people just you know, laugh at those kind of arguments, really. Right. Um, I can think of some people who are in the state next to yours in Florida right now who've you know, experienced <laughs> much colder than normal <laughs> temperatures over the last several months, and they think, Global warming, bring it on. We've, you know, we've got a lousy winter down here. Anyway, Doug McDonald, you wanted exactly. to add. Steve, I, I'd like to suggest that with, with your questions here of what scientists should do, and, with, and uh, I'd like to respectfully uh, disagree a little bit with, with David's response, and, and perhaps with Judy's as well, that you're, you're asking scientists to carry too much of the burden, that when you're saying, that, well, they should be communicating differently, they should be considering emotion. I think the job of scientists is to do science. And it's other people in the policy dynamic that should be uh, doing other things. Even if they don't have the expertise for it. Well, ultimately, as we come back to this distinction that we've been making uh, of science. As Gord was saying, science deals with uncertainty. Uh, politics needs uh, certainty. Uh, you made a distinction between science and emotion. But also, politics, at the end of the day, is about values. It's about what it means to be a human being, the kind of society we want to have, it's how much we value future generations. And science doesn't move into the realm of values at all. Jim, science, uh, excuse me, politics is also about the art of the possible. And, yes. and if, if scientists haven't convinced politicians that this is the number one serious issue of our day, the art of the possible becomes a lot less than perhaps the values Doug is describing. Is that fair to say? Yes, I, I, and I think uh, the uh, extreme event issue is a, a typical one that uh, uh, gives the scientists a real dilemma as to how forceful to be because you can't say that a particular extreme event was due to climate change. I don't use the word global warming. Um, and, but you, you do know that as uh, there are higher temperatures in the atmosphere, the atmosphere holds more water vapor. So when the atmosphere gets ready to rain or to snow, it rains more or snows more. Mm -hmm. And uh, we know that. Uh, that's a long-standing uh, part of atmospheric physics. So uh, how, how you explain that uh, to the public and to politicians that while you can't 
attribute a particular event to climate change, you can see a trend in these events uh, that is very much uh, evidently due to climate change. Gordon Miller. Just a, 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 something that hasn't come up clearly, and I think it's worthy of raising this, is the fact that scientists deal in, in much longer time frames than the public has to deal with. You know, we're or driven... Politicians our, have to well, our politics have their own little short-term political mm -hmm. cycle. Plus, uh, we, we've adopted economic models to make all our decisions now. And ec economics deals in very short term. I mean, with the, we have these discount president, you know, present value calculations that basically anything out that's 50 years out in the future, economists don't worry about. Mm -hmm. We're scientists worry very much about what's happening 50 years out and, and beyond. And, and part of the thing is that we, you know, scientists make, uh, draw conclusions and say, look, you know, in, in 2050 is one of the numbers we use in climate change to say we have to radically reduce um, our, our carbon emissions by that okay, time. Okay, but hold that thought. How do you get a politician, if it's a minority government, in the Federal House of Commons? Uh, it could be an election in a year. They're looking at their mortality a year down the road. The McGuinty government's going to have a little consultation with the people in a year and a half. How do you get people to make policy based on the needs of 40 years down the road when, excuse me, 18 months from now, you know, our, our tushies are on the line, so to speak? True, but we, we used to, right? I mean, if you look at even in Ontario, the Ontario government, you know, it's it set aside, not that I'm a big fan of major highways, but, but the, the, you know, the highways corridor for, for 407 was, was set aside by a government 40 years ago. And, and that, that's the kind of planning that used to be routine in Ontario. Why don't we do it anymore? I, that I don't have That's an a different for. show. That's a different <laughs> show. Uh, since we all want to quote Al Gore, uh, let's do that right now. Al Gore uh, being the leader of the environmental movement, as we've heard so many times tonight. Uh, here's what he wrote in the New York Times last month. I, for one, the former VP says, genuinely wish that the climate crisis were an illusion. But unfortunately, the reality of the danger we are courting has not been changed by the discovery of at least two mistakes in the thousands of pages of careful scientific work over the last 22 years by the IPCC. It is true that the climate panel published a flawed overestimate of the melting rate of debris-covered glaciers in the Himalayas. In addition, emails, ma email messages stolen from the University of East Anglia in Britain showed that scientists besieged by an onslaught of hostile, make-work demands from climate skeptics may not have adequately followed the requirements of the British Freedom of Information law. But the scientific enterprise will never be completely free of mistakes. Here's the question. David, why don't you start with this one? If scientists are going to get involved in the political process, can they really be surprised that those whose interests do not align with theirs would jump on those mistakes, even to the point of using hostile tactics? No, they, they shouldn't be surprised. And, and in fact, I think that, uh, that scientists, uh, the, the IPCC scientists and, and those who, uh, who have spoken on their behalf have defended themselves very well. You know, one of those two mistakes was how much of Holland was below sea level. And, and those numbers were given to the IPCC by the Dutch government. And uh, it's hard to blame the IPCC for, for, for that mistake. And the other fact is, which is, which is forgotten about in the, uh, in the melting of the glaciers, is that the, the science uh, report, Working Group 1's report, of the IPCC got it dead right. It was the uh, the second uh, the second working group that got it wrong, uh, and they were a group that was concerned with the uh, the impacts and the social science of uh, of climate change. So, I, in fact, I think that there was out of those what 1,300 pages uh, in the IPCC reports, very very little that was uh, was open to, uh, to to criticism. And and I think that uh, indeed scientists should not be surprised, but I think that they were intensely dismayed because you know. If somebody goes hacking emails, you know very well they're doing it with an agenda, to borrow the, the word that's uh, for, for, the, for this, this, this program, but they did it with an agenda. And it wasn't an agenda that had to do with finding out more about the science. It was, in fact, to try to get a march on the scientists. So I don't think the scientists should be surprised at all. They should regard that as, in fact, part of the game that, that they're in. And, and I think that if I may just add to, 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 uh, to Gord's um, uh, suggestion that, in fact, we're stereotyping scientists, I think it is very very dangerous to do that. And I think that it's also very dangerous, if I may with respect, say, to, to say that the scientists have done their job. I don't think the scientists have done their job at all. They've done the science part of the job. But I think that scientists, in fact, have another part to do. And that is to, to teamwork teamwork with the policymakers. Uh, you, you cannot, you cannot uh, have a model which has scientists doing their work, their pure work that doesn't have anything to do with politics and policy, and hand it off to government and say, now you do yours. That's not the way okay. that good decisions get made, David, and I, I think I that's very important. I see Judy champing at the bit in Atlanta to get into this as well. Go ahead, Judy. Give us your view on that. Um, 
Yeah, I, I would agree there has to be you know, better engagement of the scientists with the policymakers. If you just let scientists do their thing and expect somebody else to do the communicating, the other group that ends up doing that would be environmental advocacy groups, and then you end up with alarmism, sure. sort of exaggerating the situation, and then you get a backlash you know, from you know, the libertarian think tanks against that, and, and then you get you know, an accelerating warfare kind of situation with the scientists being overly defensive, and people start pointing their guns at the wrong people, and then you end up with a kind of mess that we've seen. So, so I think you, you need to have the scientists actively engaged in communicating the risks and not just leaving that to the advocacy groups sure. because it's going to be exaggerated and you're going to get some element of alarmism. And, and you need to have good partnerships between at least some of the scientists, you know, with the policymakers, you know, working in constructive ways. And, and that constructive ways does not, to me, include the scientists advocating for specific policies, you know, helping the policymakers explore policy options and assess them in terms of, you know, the scientific information. So, so engaging in the policy process versus advocating for specific policies, those are two different things. So I think scientists engaging in the policy process but without advocacy is, is where you want to see that interaction. Doug McDonald? But Judy, we're, what we're leaving out of the picture is, is what lies at the heart of uh, the environmental policy process, which is basically negotiation between the regulator and the firm. That's how environmental policy is made. Tell me what you mean by that. But government representatives uh, go in and talk to, in most cases, we're looking for behavior change from industrial actors, mm -hmm. in some cases from the public at large and, and other kinds of actors. But a large part of it is from business actors. And at the heart of environmental policy is the process by which policymakers go to business and say, look, you've got to do something to improve your performance. How much can you afford? And we've enshrined that in the concept of best available uh, standards, best available technology, technology. economically achievable. Mm -hmm. This is the way policy works. So it's true. I mean, I would agree with what Judy is saying, and uh, that yes, scientists should be in there, but we have to bear in mind si once we're actively making policy, it's not scientists who are playing a, a central role. And I would argue, nor yet should they be. It should be accountable elected officials who are making public policy decisions. And necessarily, that means dialogue with those who are being asked to pay the cost, which is the business actors. David, you want to come in on that? Yeah, I just want uh, Doug to tell me what he thinks about John Holdren's role in the, in the US. And, uh, and just explain and the Chow, reference, you know, David. The Nobel Prize winner. I mean, those David, are David, explain the reference. What do you mean? Yeah, John Holdren used to be at Harvard and uh, is now uh, uh, President Obama's chief science advisor. Uh, and, and that's, I think, an indication of an administration that wants science to be to be part of the policy making and is inviting the scientists to be at that table. I think part of what we've not done in Canada, in fact we've done the opposite in Canada, Arthur Cardi used to be the uh, the science advisor to the to the Prime Minister and over the last uh, few years uh, the science advisor to the Prime Minister has been uh, has been eliminated. We don't have a science advisor anymore. We've gone in the exact opposite direction from the Obama administration. So I, I think that there is uh, there is recognition south of the border that science indeed does have a place at the policy making table at the very very highest level and, and I, I think that's a wonderful example and I wish we did it here. Talk about I, that. I, I, I would agree we should be doing more to have scientists here in Canada playing that kind of role. But the fundamental fact of what's happening in the United States is opposition by senators from the coal producing states. It's the coal industry which is at the heart of American climate change politics, not science. Let me read something Kevin Libin wrote in the uh, Financial Post last month about this. Ours is a society, he wrote, obsessed with scientific studies, awash in products and technologies few fully comprehend, and anxious about their safety, we beseech PhDs for clarity about pesticides, cell phones, baby bottle plastics. The media readily delivers answers, but uncritically. A recent examination by healthnewsreview.org found TV news shows habitually portray research on new drugs or health scares unquestioningly, ignoring dissent or interest conflicts. 
We long ago learned to be leery of media corporations and government. If Climategate raises doubts about global warming, it also raises perhaps overdue ones about the credibility of the folks in white coats. Okay, Jim Bruce, is he onto something there? I hope not. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think that, the, that uh, uh, this is another case, like the ones I cited earlier, the acid rain issue, the uh, pollution of the Great Lakes issue, where when the implications of the science uh, get to be fully understood by the business community that likes likely to be affected and the politicians who are in close uh, cooperation with them, uh, that a pushback comes along. Uh, and the best way to do the pushback for those people is to try to undermine the science. And uh, that's what we see happening here. And uh, it, it's uh, uh, a, a standard procedure on environmental issues in the, in the struggle between the scientific community on the one hand, the environmentalists in another corner, uh, the business in the third corner, and the government in the fourth. Let me get Gord and Judy both on this issue of whether or not, whether or not the credibility of climate change scientists has been damaged by the East Anglia business, the, uh, you know, the business I think the regrettably it has because, I, and I agree with, you know, with Jim, that this is, we've seen this before historically, but I don't think not with the bitterness, not with the, 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 the sort of the aggressiveness and, and uh, violence of the attacks on the scientists. I mean, um, they were the, the scientists were challenged. I was around for the you know the phosphorus stuff when I was a grad student, and the and the, certainly the acid rain you know pro program I, I worked in. And and yes, there were challenges, but these are personal attacks on people we see now, and people uh, really live in fear of their reputation. Motives being impugned. It, totally, the careers they try to destroy their careers, and I think that's that's a, a level of viciousness in this kind of thing that we haven't seen before, and it has had an effect, and it, I think it's. I think it's uh, put a chilling effect on, on some scientists who, who, who are reluctant to come forward and, and defend the results publicly for that reason. And, and I think that's clearly the intent of the program. Judy, your view on that? Yeah, well, credibility is a combination of expertise and trust. And in the, the whole climate gate thing, we're seeing challenges to both. I mean, the, the trust issue um, associated with scientists allegedly cooking the books and and being, you know, having their advocacy influence their science. And then there's also challenges to um, their expertise with, with st statistical experts and computer science experts and physicists coming in and saying, these climate researchers aren't really up to snuff. They're not really doing the job up to the, you know, the, the higher standards of science. So, so we're, but the credibility is being challenged on both fronts in terms of climate gate. And, and, and the trust issue is probably the more important one. You know, w once you lose the trust and people, you know, lose their confidence, it's not easy to get it back. And, and I've been communicating w with, with some of the um, libertarian think tank uh, groups that are, you know, involved in these Freedom of Information Act requests and, and really at the forefront of keeping the pressure on. and. They're not out to destroy individual scientific reputations. Their concern, you know, the concern, the way it's, I understand it, is that they haven't seen the case laid out in a way that makes sense. And they're trying to, and they think it does hinge on the science, and so that they're... Judy, sorry, I'm going to interrupt you. Know, you. you really the, believe the that, science. eh? You don't think the fact that some of this research, and I'm not naming names here, but some of it's funded by oil yeah. companies may have something to do with what they're up to? Um, the oil company, you know, I, I used to think that, you know, even like six months ago, I thought that, but as a result of my speaking out on this issue, a lot of these groups have started communicating with me in a rather testy manner, you know, trying to get some sort of dialogue and understanding on this issue. And um, the, the liver, they don't have oil company money anymore, the, the libertarian think tanks. Um, there, there is, you know, coal is really um, out there, but it's not so much the oil company issue, but, but this is more a little bit more principled than just... Okay, well, that's good to know anyway. Being Listen, we've got about three and a half minutes so, left so to go here. So there is some complexity. We've got yeah. about three and a half minutes There's left to go here. There's a lot of complexity in it. So, sure, Let, let's try this one last thing here. Uh, to be sure, there is politics in everything. There is politics in science. 
but there's there's politics in politics like there's not politics in anything else, right? <laughs> it is uh, brass knuckles, uh, elbows up, uh, get in the corners, uh, knock your opponent out, all of that kind of stuff. And I wonder, Gordon, let's start with you on this. Given the events of the recent past few months, are scientists going to be more reluctant going forward to get involved in the political process given what you've just described? Yeah, I think so. Uh, in the short term, I, I hope it won't last. I, I think there's a chill on right now. There's no question. And what's the impact of that? Well, the, ch the impact is that we can't get the kind of uh, public discussion and frank discussion in this, you know, uh, uh, public education needed for the, uh, for the confidence of the public to come back. It'll be, it'll be chilled for a period of time, but it will come back, and, and, and the scientists will regain the, the trust of the public and it, because we, you know, the, the data's there, the facts are there. But time will have been lost. The time is lost, and of course, Time is money to certain, you know, uh, uh, businesses that uh, every quarter are making $11 billion profits. David Pearson, what's your view on that? Yeah, I think that this is just a blip. I, I think Gord's right that it won't last very long. Uh, and I think also that if you look at public opinion polls and, and you look at uh, which group of people in society are most trusted, you, you find that it's scientists. Uh, over 70% of the public will trust scientists before they trust lawyers, politicians, the media, you name it. So I, I think that uh, there's a lot that's good here and a lot that's right. And sure, this is a blip. I mean, think, think about what happened to Tylenol and think how Tylenol came out of, uh, came out of that. We, we just don't have to be unnerved by this, uh, this, uh, this short-term attack. I, I, think, uh, I think in a year's time we'll be, we'll be looking at this as history. Jim Bruce, uh, it, it seems reasonable that some um, scientists are going to be a little more leery about getting politically involved now. What do you think the impact of that will be? Uh, I think one of the things that's going to happen is, is that scientists will begin to complete their work. Uh, everybody who's been saying their job is done it isn't done. Uh, for example, what do we know about how, how climate change is going to affect Canada's water resources? I'm, I'm convinced it's going to increase water pollution, it's going to reduce water supplies in a very profound way that will affect the people of the country seriously. <clears throat> and, and, but that science is still in its infancy. It hasn't been done yet and needs to be pushed very hard. Doug, you want the last 30 seconds on that? I would agree with the comment that it's a blip. I think it's going to be a bit more. It's going to be an ongoing background noise. It's rather like uh, the people who dispute science of evolution. They've been around for many, many years. But it's not going to influence policy. Uh, this is an ongoing sideshow, I gotcha. would argue. I want to thank everybody for participating in uh, part three of four for our climate change specials this week. Judy Curry at the Georgia Institute of Technology in Atlanta. Jim Bruce, uh, formerly of Environment Canada in the nation's capital. David Pearson, Laurentian University in Sudbury. Here in Toronto, Doug McDonald from the University of Toronto. Gord Miller, our environmental commissioner here in Ontario. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Pleasure.